Well, last week we had uh, the privilege of having a special guest to have Pastor uh, Bruce Hunger uh, speak to us and uh, uh, pick up again where we had left off two weeks ago, <coughs> covering a, a question I had received in the question box, which essentially comes down to how can you tell if somebody is saved? <coughs> and <coughs> We're going to be answering that question in a, uh, in a study of the first epistle of John uh, because it focuses on that issue of uh, what are the evidences of somebody's true salvation. And, <clears throat> and looking at that, it's, it's such an important question because the Bible makes plain to us that <clears throat> the majority of people think that they are going to heaven that they're on their way to heaven when in fact the Bible tells us they are not. And Jesus himself said they are not. In Matthew 7, he said, Enter ye in at the straight gate, the narrow gate. And for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight, or narrow, is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. <clears throat> That is kind of a, a shocking truth. If you, if you could tell the whole world that, hey, wake up. You think that you're going to be okay at death. You are not. <clears throat> the Savior of the world has warned the world <clears throat> that broad is the way that leads to destruction. <clears throat> we looked at Matthew 7, 21 and 23 where Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. So it's even a warning to those who claim to be Christians let alone those that don't even uh, claim to know Christ. It's a warning even to those who claim to know uh, Christ. He says, He that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, that's, that's the ones who will be in heaven. And in another place Jesus said, The will of my Father is to believe on him whom the Father has sent. <clears throat> Jesus said, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have done cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Jesus didn't say some. He said many are going to think that not only are they good enough, but they actively serve God, speaking on his behalf, and doing good deeds in his name, and yet these things can never earn someone a place in heaven. And those people are going to find themselves... Um, eternally shocked uh, to find out that that will not get them into heaven. That is not good enough. There is no such thing as being good enough. And then and we looked at a phrase that Jesus used over and over and over and over as he taught the crowds. And, and that is he would finish his, his parable, his lesson, by saying, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And we examined that and saw that that, that phrase goes all the way back to Old Testament times and is a condemnation, saying that uh, to the crowds of people who were hearing the word of God, that in fact it wasn't getting through to them. That they may have been following along with the Israelites, they may have been born Jewish, they may have been an Israelite, and yet they were not true followers of God. And God said that they were a rebellious household and uh, that they didn't have ears to hear. Uh, the, the word of God. So uh, it was spoken to them, but it never got through. It never got through. <clears throat> and uh, and God knew that uh, over and over. He knew that many of the people uh, sitting out there in the crowd, listening to his lessons, were one day going to stand in the court of Pontius Pilate and cry, crucify him, crucify him. Uh, so he knew who they were. Uh, <clears throat> he knew that they were not truly following him. And so the truth that that we see uh, um, is that a whole lot of what passes for Christianity today and a whole lot of, of who passes for Christians are not. It's not genuine Christianity and they're not true Christians just because they claim to be one. <clears throat> and so it's worthwhile to look at what the Bible has to say about what is the evidence that somebody is truly saved. Not just that they say that they are, uh, not just that they even show up at church because going into a garage doesn't make you a car. <clears throat> so, uh, <clears throat> so we're looking at that. And Jesus, when he taught the crowds and said, He that hath ears to hear, let them hear, 
Uh, we found out that Jesus taught in parables not in order to reveal truth to these crowds, to these people, but to conceal it, to keep them from hearing the truth, which may be a shocking thing, but in fact, that's what the Bible says. <clears throat> in Matthew 13, 34, the Bible says, All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them. Uh, and in uh, Mark 4, And with many such parables spake he the word unto them, as they were able to hear it. But without a parable spake he not unto them. And when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. So there was, without a doubt, hundreds of people in those crowds that were true believers. <clears throat> and he would explain the parables to them. <clears throat> but his disciples wondered about, why are you always teaching them in parables? And they asked him about it. <clears throat> and in Matthew 13, 11, Jesus answered him and said, Because it is given unto you, true disciples, to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. God said, they don't get to know. They don't get to know. Here's, here's the Savior of the world saying to people that are phony balonies who are claiming to follow him, but in fact from their heart they're not, says they don't get to know the truth because they have not, there's no true repentance there. In verse 16, he said, But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. <clears throat> so, there is this whole um, uh, <clears throat> continuing false Christianity <clears throat> that has continued from the time of Christ, well, actually, going all the way back to the nation of Israel, <clears throat> um, of those who claim to be believers and followers of Almighty God, who in fact are not. <clears throat> and that is not only worth knowing, critical to know if we're going to examine what are the evidences of somebody who is truly saved, and that is a main focus of the first epistle of John. So two weeks ago we started looking at John as a man, John the, the Apostle. <coughs> he is typically referred to as the, the disciples, Mr. Christ, but people have an image oftentimes in their mind of what John was like and it probably isn't anything close to what he was truly like. <clears throat> and in fact, if you have seen, and I think probably everybody has, Da Vinci's painting, The Last Supper, uh, John is depicted looking like a woman with long hair and feminine features. And uh, <clears throat> he's, he's painted as somebody with these dove-like eyes just gazing up into Christ's eyes and um, a very passive individual and in fact he wasn't anything like that and he was a far cry from from a passive person uh, the truth is that John was a very outgoing and almost a volatile sort of person in some ways he is the opposite of the way that he's depicted he was uh, emotional he was rather demanding <clears throat> and in a sense he's really a man for our times because his writings are very bold, very direct, very dogmatic, which means somebody who, who uh, lays down principles as being incontrovertibly true. Uh, and in today's typical Christian, quote-unquote, church, you find a great amount of tolerance, inclusiveness, uncertainty, acceptance of any kind of lifestyle, uh, it's not only lacking in any real doctrinal clarity, it's lacking in any kind of dogmatism, it's lacking in conviction, it's given to tolerance and compromise. And so <clears throat> that's the world that we live in right now. Now that, fortunately, that does not describe our church at all. <clears throat> but their Christianity at large in the United States and in other places around the world <clears throat> is this hodgepodge of almost no firm beliefs whatsoever, and anybody and everybody is accepted uh, regardless of their lifestyle, oftentimes regardless of what their beliefs are, uh, what their action is, <clears throat> and so it's a good time to hear from the Apostle John. <clears throat> John the Apostle, he's a man for our times <clears throat> to confront the laxity in Christianity the shallowness among professed people of God and the lack of real conviction about what is right and what isn't. And so, <clears throat> a few interesting notes that we had started with last time. 
John never identifies himself as the author of his gospel, nor of his three epistles. He never says, I'm John the Apostle, I wrote this. <coughs> and yet, we can be quite certain that he is the author of both his gospel and his three epistles, as well as the book of Revelation. We know he wrote them, first of all, because that has been the uncontroverted testimony of, of church history from literally from the very first century. Uh, <clears throat> they were, there were people that knew John uh, all the way back in the first century, and <clears throat> they testified to John's authorship of the epistles and of his gospel and of the book of Revelation. And <clears throat> they passed down that information to the next generation, to the next, to the next, to the next, etc. And so uh, there is a, a universal, strong, and consistent testimony of John's authorship traced all the way back <clears throat> to the people who knew John personally. And uh, <clears throat> the fact that John doesn't name himself argues, uh, in a very real sense, for his authorship. <clears throat> because only a well-known and prominent, in fact, there would have to be a well-known and a prominent apostle could write uh, a letter to the churches <clears throat> uh, claiming authority, giving instruction, and not name himself unless everybody knew who he was. Well, the fact is, is John was the last apostle alive. <clears throat> uh, and by the time he started writing, which was probably uh, uh, just in the last decade of the first century, all the other apostles had already been executed. He was the last one. He was the only one. And so for him to write, everybody knew who he was. So he didn't even have to say, by the way, this is John the Apostle. And so everybody knew who he was. And he claimed divine authority and, uh, and expected obedience uh, to what he wrote because of that authority. And didn't have to say, <coughs> he didn't have to identify himself. And it was also part of his, his personality type. He was very self-effacing by this time in his life, even though he didn't start out that way. He typically referred to himself, when he had to refer to himself, as the apostle that Jesus loved. Because that's where his focus was. It wasn't on who he was anymore. It wasn't on, on how special he was. It was on the fact that he was loved by Jesus Christ. Uh, <clears throat> he was quite a man that way. <clears throat> the disciple whom Jesus loved. Every time he had to make a reference to himself, he used it as an opportunity to speak of Christ's love for him. <clears throat> so that was evidence <clears throat> of his authorship. <clears throat> Additionally, both John's Gospel and the Epistles were written uh, to combat <clears throat> a single heresy uh, that later became known as Gnosticism. Uh, which it eventually developed into uh, a century or so later, but the seeds of it were already present and had already begun to affect the church in the time of John's life at the end of the first century. And Gnosticism, we said, is kind of hard to define because there are so many different sects and, and uh, um, versions of it, but essentially Gnosticism is Christianity perverted by philosophy. Um, and understanding Gnosticism comes from the, the base word of it, Gnosis, and that word means knowledge. <clears throat> Gnostics believe that Christian faith <clears throat> um, had been superseded by a special philosophical and, uh, and high knowledge that they had gained uh, that was vastly superior to simple Christian faith as taught by those who trusted the Bible alone. <clears throat> Gnostics thought that they were better than everybody else, and they had <clears throat> infiltrated the church, and Gnosticism began to call itself Christianity. <clears throat> but they had a mystery knowledge, a higher knowledge, that regular Christians couldn't have. <clears throat> they had secret knowledge, and they guarded it as a secret. And it wasn't based on reflection or scientific inquiry or scientific uh, proof or anything like that. They claimed that it was on special revelations that they had gotten either from, they claim, Jesus himself, or from uh, his disciples, or from his friends. <clears throat> and they had secret traditions, and secret handshakes, and secret this, and secret that. <clears throat> and um, those kind of mystic religions exist to this day. <clears throat> Mormonism is a perfect example of it. 
They, they have their own secret special writings. Now, anybody can get a Book of Mormon, but they claim that it came from golden plates um, <clears throat> given to Joseph Smith and translated by an angel named Moroni or Moroni or something like that. And they have uh, secret handshakes and all kinds of secret things about uh, their, their church and their way of doing things. Uh, even Freemasonry is a mystic religion. And you don't learn much of what it's all about in the early stages of indoctrination or anything like that. But I read a book a number of years ago from somebody who had been a, I forget what the highest degree is, 34th degree, something like that, Mason, and had gotten saved and then wrote an expose on all this stuff. <clears throat> but uh, they believe that there was a, a, a religion a, 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 that had special knowledge <clears throat> and special uh, acceptance with God <clears throat> and so that that Gnosticism which continues to this very day had its seeds way back uh, unfortunately in even the first century church <clears throat> and um, John wrote his gospel and his epistles um, <clears throat> to help combat uh, that uh, that false belief that that false idea and already by the first century and a few decades after the death of the Apostle Paul, the seeds of this false doctrine, uh, they had already taken root to develop into this, what would eventually be called Gnosticism. From about 90 to 95 of the first century, John was the guy in charge. He was the last apostle. And so he was in charge in particular of the churches of Asia Minor, uh, which is now modern day Turkey. And John was the pastor of the church at Ephesus, and uh, <clears throat> which had been founded, as you know, uh, by the Apostle Paul. But Paul was now off the scene. All the other apostles were off the scene. John was the only one left. And John is the pastor at the church of Ephesus. And it was out of the church of Ephesus that the other churches of Asia Minor had been established. <clears throat> They were the sending church, so to speak, for the other churches in Asia Minor, all of which are addressed in chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation. Uh, so John had responsibility as an apostle, as the last apostle, and as a pastor over the churches in Asia Minor during this period of time. <clears throat> and although he was uh, an old man at this point, <clears throat> he was still a very fiery proclaimer of the truth. He was still a preacher <clears throat> and a teacher and a pastor and a shepherd. <clears throat> and because of that preaching, because of that teaching, <clears throat> he was taken prisoner about the year 95, uh, about the year 95 <clears throat> by the uh, emperor uh, Domitian. <clears throat> and <clears throat> he was condemned to die in exile on an island out in the Mediterranean called the island of Patmos. It's nothing basically but a rock <clears throat> Um, offshore of, of, of Turkey. The whole island is only 13 square miles. And they would exile people there. So there was, I don't know if he was the only person on the isle or not, but <clears throat> he was one of only a handful. Uh, to this day, um, there's about 3,000 people that live on the island today. But back then, it was just a place of exile. And uh, <clears throat> that happened about the year 96 AD. And it was while he was in exile on the island of Patmos <clears throat> that he was given the vision, which is the book of Revelation. And that revelation had to be <clears throat> a great encouragement to what was probably a very discouraged apostle. <clears throat> and we don't know for certain what, what his thinking was at the time, what his emotions were, but he certainly had reason to feel um, discouraged. Um, <clears throat> he was being persecuted. In fact, he had been taken out of circulation. Uh, he was now in exile on the Isle of Patmos. Uh, <clears throat> but even more than that was the fact that he knew that the churches over which he had leadership or <clears throat> were beginning to turn away from the truth. And, uh, and we see that in the, the seven letters to the churches of Asia Minor in the second and third chapter of Revelation those seven churches, only two of them got words of praise and the other five got words of condemnation. And, and these were the churches that John had oversight of, that, uh, <clears throat> that he was responsible for. 
<clears throat> and so he already saw what was happening in those churches. So it had to be uh, discouraging to him. So the revelation that God gave him would have been a great encouragement and that there was a glorious future, even though the present time <clears throat> was tragic, even though he was in exile, even though he had been, I've heard the term used, patmosized. <clears throat> he had been excluded. He had been <clears throat> sent into exile. And <clears throat> he had lived to see the destruction of the city of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Uh, Christ has said, not one, speaking of the temple, not one stone would be left upon another. And he had seen that happen. In fact, that's probably how he wound up in Ephesus, is that he must have fl uh, flew from Jerusalem uh, when that destruction happened in AD 70. Uh, <clears throat> so he had witnessed that. The land of Israel had been massacred. Uh, history tells us that there were 985 Jewish towns and villages that had been slaughtered by the power of Rome at that time. So things didn't look good for God's promises to the nation of Israel. And they didn't look good for Christ's promises to the church either. Um, the, the apostles for uh, a long time had expected that Christ could come back any day. They didn't have any clue that it would be thousands of years before that return would, would be likely. Uh, and so they were trying to get the gospel out to the entire known world so that Christ would return. And now they were facing this horrible persecution and things were not going well for the church. The church was in disarray despite John's best efforts and the seeds of compromise and of iniquity and sin had already found their way into the church and here he was sitting in exile himself. <clears throat> and then all of his writings were really crammed into a few years at the end of his life, at the end of the first century. He is, so to speak, the last man standing. He's the last apostle. And he had a great burden to bear as he unfolds uh, the truth of God for the last time as an apostle to, write, to wrap up all the writing of the New Testament. He's an old man at this time, uh, but until he was put in exile, he was still preaching. He was still teaching, he was still evangelizing, he was still overseeing, <clears throat> and most importantly, that's when he started writing. <clears throat> Perhaps it was pent up for a long time, because it wasn't until the last 10 years or so of his life that he started writing anything. Uh, <clears throat> we don't even hear from John uh, <clears throat> in the first 13 chapters of the book of Acts. Peter's doing all the preaching. John isn't recorded as even saying a word. And then Paul comes on the scene, and he's teaching, and he's preaching, and he's writing, and he becomes a central figure, and you really don't hear anything from John. <clears throat> John hasn't preached a sermon that's been recorded um, <clears throat> anywhere in the New Testament. So his timeline, again, was uh, we believe that probably when the destruction of Jerusalem happened in 70 AD, <clears throat> John uh, left Jerusalem and went to uh, Asia Minor and became the pastor of the church at Ephesus, <clears throat> which had been started by Paul. And sometime between 85 and 90 AD, he wrote the Gospel of John. And sometime between 90 and 94 AD, he wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, <clears throat> his epistles. Now, history and church tradition tells us that John was banished to the Isle of Patmos due to the Christian persecution under the Roman Emperor Domitian. <clears throat> and tradition also tells us that the emperor had tried to boil John in oil. <clears throat> he tried to boil him in oil. Got a big pot of oil, dumped John in it, and miraculously, he just sat there and looked at them. <clears throat> God protected them, no harm. <clears throat> he just sat there in the boiling oil, uh, and absolutely nothing happened to him. So Domitian then, banished him to the Isle of Patmos to get rid of him and said, well, I can't kill you, <clears throat> so I'm going to exile with you. History tells us that it was there God sent him to Patmos and to give him the revelation, um, <clears throat> the vision that is recorded as the book of Revelation, and that happened probably about 95 or 96 AD. <clears throat> but we know that John had to get off of Patmos <clears throat> because uh, those letters and that book of Revelation, we have it in our Bible today. So he got off there and 
Church history tells us that when uh, Domitian died, the, the next emperor, who was Nerva, he released him. And <clears throat> history says that John returned to the church at Ephesus. And <clears throat> the ancient church fathers, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Eusebius, and others, all agree that John had left the island of Patmos and spent the, his remaining days in Ephesus until he died somewhere around the close of the first century. <clears throat> so, finally, after all his years of ministry, as he comes to the end of his life, there's kind of a, a flurry and an explosion of revelations from his Savior that, that, <clears throat> that causes him to pen the Gospel of John, and then his three epistles, and then the book of Revelation, <clears throat> all in about ten years' time. <clears throat> John was the last contributor to the divine revelation. He was the last one to add to the record that God wanted written in the scriptures. And as it turned out, after for most of his ministry, hearing almost nothing from him, when all was said and done, other than the apostle John, I'm sorry, other than the apostle Paul, John wrote more books of the New Testament. <coughs> Excuse me. He wrote more books of the New Testament than any other writer. Um, having written five uh, books of the New Testament. He was ministering in Ephesus at the time of writing the Gospel. And I'd like you to turn to Acts chapter 20 for a moment before we look at 1 John. I want you to see something that I think is kind of an interesting prophecy. Now, we don't normally think <clears throat> about the book of Acts as being a book of prophecy. But there is an indication here <coughs> of a prophecy that John lived to see fulfilled. In Acts chapter 20, Paul is speaking. Paul is in Ephesus at the time. As I said, he was the, he had founded the church at Ephesus. He had established the first elders, the first pastors there, and <coughs> had continued on his missionary journeys, and now he comes back to meet with them. And they're meeting, Paul is meeting with the elders from Ephesus at a place called Miletus, which was near Ephesus. <coughs> And he's meeting with the elders that he had established there. He's been away. He's, he's come back. He's meeting with the elders of the church at Ephesus for the very last time. And in verse 28, he says this. He says, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. So he says, he says, Gentlemen, I want you to be on guard. I want you to be focused on protecting the church. Your overseers, your shepherds, you've been entrusted with the church of God, purchased with Christ's own blood. He said, be on guard. Why? He says, verse 29, for I know this. Now that's the language of Revelation. He's saying that this is something that I've been given the information on. He's received the divine revelation of prophecy. He says, for I know this. I know that after my departing, shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. That's a prophecy. Verse 30, also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, <clears throat> watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. <clears throat> Paul is saying, be on guard, be alert. Stay in the word because I've been told from God himself that when I leave, wolves will come in from the outside. <clears throat> and perverse men will rise up from the inside, leading you astray. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> imagine Paul's position in that. <clears throat> he, he was used by God to found the church in Ephesus. He stayed there for years and pastored the church. And, <clears throat> and while he was there, God gave him this revelation saying... The day is coming where the grievous wolves are going to enter in. <clears throat> the false prophets from the outside and false prophets are going to rise from the inside and they're going to seek to pervert this church. <clears throat> and Paul had that knowledge. He had that information. He said for three years, day after day after day, he warned the people with tears because he knew <coughs> what was coming. He knew what was going to happen. God had told him about it. <clears throat> and so... <clears throat> Paul had been given this prophecy and decades later now John writes his epistles to combat the very fulfillment of that prophecy. False teachers did come in. 
<clears throat> they came into Ephesus. They started by attacking the believers' first love, which is their love for Christ. And we find that out <clears throat> to the letter to the church at Ephesus in the book of Revelation. <clears throat> Christ warned them, saying, you've left your first love. <clears throat> now imagine how that must have felt to John. He was the pastor of that church. <clears throat> and he had to have said, you're right. I've seen it. I know it. It's, it's happening. <clears throat> They've left their first love. So they had <clears throat> probably the best pastor they could have had, and yet they were still starting to drift away. <clears throat> and that had to break John's heart. They were sowing the seeds of what, as I said, be, became Gnosticism, <clears throat> uh, questioning the fundamentals of the Christian faith, questioning the true relationship between the deity and the humanity of Christ, qu questioning who is really a Christian, who is a genuine believer, because these false teachers, <clears throat> uh, who were also obviously false Christians, they wanted to add some inclusiveness in the church. They wanted the church to be more inclusive. They wanted to open the definition of who is saved a, a little wider to include people that don't actually have biblical faith in Christ alone. <clears throat> Get the feeling nothing's changed in 2,000 years? <clears throat> There's cries for more inclusiveness within Christianity. <clears throat> but that means compromising the truth. And so that pressure uh, to become uh, less uh, demanding of what is required in salvation has not gone away at, uh, <clears throat> at all in 2,000 years. We're still living with that. And John, who lived to see the fulfillment of, of Paul's prophecy, writes his epistles to cry out for the truth of the gospel, the narrowness of the gospel, <clears throat> writing from uh, Ephesus to the church, <clears throat> Uh, and first to the church in Asia Minor, those seven churches, but of course that revelation then uh, was distributed to all the churches, warning them about the insidious inroads being made of this false doctrine. And he calls for believers to hold exclusively to this perspective. And he does so in terms that are, that are clear and absolutely unambiguous. <clears throat> and we're out of time. <clears throat> so next time we're going to talk about something that was fundamental to John's, I don't want to say his character, it became part of his character, it was fundamental to his training, that Christ had to train into him, which really unlocks the key of understanding who this man was that God used to write these epistles. So let's have a word of prayer and we'll be finished for today.